Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues. Today I am going to be discussing some of the doctrinal differences between Christianity and Islam. In discussing these differences, we will also encounter similarities. So there will be a blend between the two. I'm going to begin by discussing the Christian versus the Islamic views towards Jesus Christ. I would like to start by reading a portion of a surah, surah 3, ayat 45 through 47, from the translation of the meaning of the Holy Quran. Quote, Behold, the angels said, O Mary, Allah gives you glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, held in honor in this world and the hereafter, and of the company of those nearest to Allah. He shall speak to the people in childhood and in maturity, and he shall be of the company of the righteous. She said, O my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? He said, even so, Allah creates what he wills. When he has decreed a plan, he says to it, be, and it is. This is a passage in the Holy Quran that describes the conversation between the angel Jibreel and Miriam when Jibreel was manifested in front of her to present her with the news of the gift from Allah of the Son, Jesus Christ. I like to begin with this because it is important that everybody understands that Judaism, whereas, whereas Judaism recognizes that Jesus Christ may have lived, but denies his prophethood, in fact, denies his legitimacy, Christianity in a variety of sects is divided over how they view Jesus Christ. There are differences between the Unitarians and the Trinitarians, between the Adoptionists, between the Western and Eastern Christianity. Uh, there are many differences, but outside of Christianity, Islam is the only other major religion that honors and respects Jesus Christ as what he claimed to be, and that is a prophet of God. Now, in this passage that I just read, we learn many things. We learn his name will be Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter. We learn that Islam holds Jesus Christ in honor. We learn Allah gives you glad tidings of a word from him. Not the word, a word. So, Muslims believe that Jesus Christ is a word of Allah. Not the word of Allah, and we'll come back to that, but a word of Allah. At the same time, quote, he shall speak to the people in childhood and in maturity. Speaking to the people in childhood is a miracle for a child to speak to the people to convey the knowledge. Again, something I will return to. We learn another point. How does Mary respond when she hears this prediction of the coming of Jesus Christ through her? She says, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? Again, reference to the virgin birth which is an article of faith in Islam. To break this down a little bit and put them in order, we learn from this passage that Muslims respect that Jesus was a word from God, that he is a Messiah, that he was born by virgin birth, that he was strengthened by the Holy Spirit, and that he performed miracles 
In the Islamic tradition, Jesus spoke to the people as a baby, not just as a child, but as a baby, as a newborn. And this was one of the miracles. Of course, he was gifted with revelation, which he conveyed to mankind, and he healed the lepers, he cured the blind, he raised the dead, all by the will of Allah. Muslims also believe that Jesus was raised up at the end of his ministry, that he will return. A day will come where there will be an antichrist, and Jesus Christ will return. He will vanquish the antichrist. He will establish the religion of truth around the world. And the Islamic viewpoint is that the religion of truth is going to be in its creed, the same that was taught in the Old Testament, the same that was taught in the New Testament by Jesus Christ, the same that was taught in Islam. God is one, he sent his prophets, he gave his revelation, and the book of laws is to be found within that revelation. Um, he will teach that he is a man, not the son of God, not God, but a man and a prophet of Allah. For those who question where the crucifixion fits into the scheme of things, the Islamic belief is that Jesus was not crucified, but he was saved, that he was raised up, and it was made to seem to the people as if Jesus had been crucified. In other words, it was a deception. The people were deceived, Jesus Christ was raised up, another was crucified in his place, and the people thought that Jesus Christ had been crucified. I would point out, however, that many early Christian groups disagreed on this point. There were many who believed that Jesus Christ was not crucified. This is not a belief that is unique to the Islamic religion. The early Christian groups were very much at odds over this point. Some believed that Jesus Christ had been crucified. Others believed, as Islam does, that another was crucified in his place. And when you just think about the mercy of our Creator, the justice of our Creator, our Creator is fair and just. Does it make sense that he would crucify a prophet? Does it make sense that he would crucify one of his beloved? Or does it make more sense that he would crucify one who was deserving of crucifixion, such as a criminal, such as a traitor, such as possibly Judas? This is one of the Islamic viewpoints, that it was not Jesus Christ who was crucified, the prophet. Rather, it was the criminal and the traitor, the one deserving of crucifixion, the one who betrayed Jesus Christ, and that was Judas. Not to get too far from the point, but the point is that there are many consistencies and there are some differences between Christian and Islamic view on this issue. Both Christianity and Islam believe that when Jesus Christ returns, he will deny those who are upon false faith, he will accept those upon true faith, he will establish God's law and usher in an age in which the righteous will prevail. Whereas Christianity believes that Jesus Christ will return in a manner in which he establishes Christianity as the truth, Islam believes that Christ will return in a victory of faith and he will establish the same things that he taught in the New Testament, which as I have discussed in my previous talks, were very much at odds with what Paul was teaching. Jesus taught the oneness of God, Paul taught what was taken by the Pauline theologians and turned into the Trinity. Jesus called himself the Son of Man 88 times. Never called himself the Son of God in a begotten, not made sense. Pauline theologians derived the doctrine of the divine sonship. Jesus taught direct accountability. 
Just everybody is accountable to God directly with no intercessors. You don't pray to saints or to Mary or to Jesus himself. You don't need to make a confession and gain absolution through a priest. No, your relationship is directly between you and God. Paul set up Jesus as an intercessor. Jesus called himself an ethnic prophet, not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Paul called him a prophet to all mankind. And on and on. Jesus taught Old Testament law. Paul canceled it. In fact, it is difficult to find anything that Jesus taught that Paul did not teach the opposite on. So it is sad to find Christianity in, in the modern day modeled more around the teachings of Paul, which are contradictory to the teachings of Jesus Christ. The exact opposite, in fact, of what we would expect. But that is the way it is. Muslims, as I said, expect Jesus Christ to return in the victory of faith and to teach what he taught before. God is one. Jesus Christ himself is a man. Our accountability to God is directly to God without intercessor, etc. Now, do we find any hint in the New Testament that should make us concerned uh, that the Islamic viewpoint might be correct? Yes, we do. And after this break, I'm going to come directly back to that point. Please bear with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Where, where are we going in this world of war? Welcome back. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown doing another episode of Interfaith Issues. We are discussing the Islamic view of Jesus Christ contrasted and compared with the Christian view. Uh, I left before the break uh, suggesting that we look through the New Testament and consider the possibility that the Islamic view might be correct. Is there anything in the New Testament to suggest to us that we should be concerned that when Jesus Christ returns, he will disavow those who professed to speak in his name? And yes, there is. If we read Matthew 7, 21 through 23, it reads as follows, quote, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lord, Lord, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, professing belief is not enough. Christianity, much of the world of Christianity, hangs upon the belief that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be forgiven. But here we have Jesus Christ himself saying, that's not enough. If we read James, we learn it's not enough from his viewpoint either. It is entitled, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Just having faith is not enough. And according to the words of Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Take care. The staged theatrics that we see the staged theatrics that we see fall in the category of what Jesus Christ is referring to here. Prophecies in his name, casting out demons in his name, many wonders in his name. And what happens to those people who did these things, committed these wonders in his name, these exorcisms, these prophecies, he declares, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice what? Lawlessness. Which is a clue to us. 
the message of Jesus Christ was about adhering to the law, the Old Testament law. Rabbi Jesus, Rabbi Jesus. What is a rabbi? A rabbi is someone who upholds and teaches the Old Testament law. So this passage clearly predicts a time when Jesus Christ will return and disown seemingly, seemingly pious followers, despite the wondrous works that they appear to have done in his name. Why? Because they did not adhere to the law that he instructed them to follow. Let's move on. What does it mean to be a word of God? I mentioned that in Islam, Islam understands Jesus Christ to be a word of God, not the word of God, a word of God. In biblical contrast, John 1.1 1, 1 reads, quote, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You ask a Christian what this means, and they say, well, that means, that means uh, Jesus Christ, he was the Logos. What does that mean? Logos is only the Greek word for word. To say that Jesus is the Logos is to say nothing more than Jesus is a word, Jesus is Logos, and that is word. It is circular reasoning. It does not resolve anything. In contrast, the Islamic viewpoint is that Jesus Christ was not the word, whatever Christians understand that to mean, it was the word of creation, the word by which Allah brings anything into existence. He simply says, be and it is. Surah 347 points out, Allah creates what he wills. When he has decreed a plan, he but says to it, be and it is. Do we find any examples of that in the Bible? Yes, we do. Genesis 1-3, God is reported to have said, quote, let there be. And you know what? There it was. If we read the Holy Quran, Surah 3, Ayat 59, quote, the similitude of Jesus before God is as that of Adam. He created him from dust, then said to him, be, and he was. Well, for those who claim that the word of John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, implies equality between Jesus and God, we encounter a problem. That problem is 1 Corinthians 3.23. 1 Corinthians 3.23 reads, And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's, with an apostrophe. First of all, in what way are ye Christ's? It doesn't mean you are part of Christ. You are a follower of Christ, perhaps. You are a believer in Christ, perhaps. Um, but no way are you part of Christ. And then, in what way is Christ God's? If the analogy is to be respected, Christ is a follower of God's teachings, a believer in God, a man of God, a prophet of God. And if there was ever a place for God to have said, Jesus is God, wouldn't this have been it? He is saying, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Why didn't he say Christ is God, if he truly is? The fact that it was left out, the fact that it does not read Christ is God, but rather reads Christ is God's, is highly significant. This is the manner in which Muslims understand the place of Jesus Christ in the continuity of Revelation. A prophet, a man, a man of God, but not a partner with God, not a co-sharer in the divinity. Now, does that make sense that God is alone and one without partner, without the Trinity? Depends on how you look at things. If you look at things according to the scripture, yes, it does. Isaiah 45, 22, for I am God and there is no other. Is there any, anything ambiguous about that? Uh, if there is, let's read Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Lord, 
I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. If you are to say, well, okay, God said he was one at one time, and later on Jesus Christ came along and then became partners with God, that's not what God says. I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Deuteronomy 4.39, the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If we move on, the next point of discussion is to discuss where Jesus Christ fits into the scheme of Christianity and Islam in relation to his very name, Christ. A lot of people speak of Jesus Christ without knowing what the word Christ means. In fact, the word Christ means Messiah. The first thing we have to ask is a question that many Christian missionaries ask. It's a tool by which they try to affect people's view of things. They say, was Jesus the Christ? And you say, yes. And they say, well, was Muhammad the Christ? And they say, no. And they say, oh, hmm. As if you should think about that point. Was Abraham the Christ? No. But wasn't he still a prophet? Was Moses the Christ? No. Does that mean he was not a prophet? Does a person need to be Christ to be a prophet? No. Other than Jesus, other biblical messiahs, the word from which Christ is translated? Yeah, 38 of them. Don't look for the word Christ in your translated Bible. Look for the word translated to Messiah in the Greek and, and the Hebrew originals. You will find that there were 38 biblical messiahs. Were all biblical messiahs, such as the Davidic kings and the high priests of, of ancient Palestine, now Israel, were they prophets? No. So to be a messiah does not mean that you are a prophet. Were all biblical prophets a messiah? No. So to be a messiah does not mean you are a prophet. To be a prophet does not mean that you are a messiah. Lastly, if there were biblical messiahs who are not even prophets, how can we say, how can being a messiah equate to divinity if it doesn't even equate to piety? This is a question that we have to take seriously. But we're going to have to pick this discussion up in part two of this section, where I will continue discussing on the role of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in Christianity and Islam. Until now, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown bidding you peace and hoping that you will return to uh, view the second part of this episode. Thank you. I feel the peace, I feel the peace. In